24th episode of the Fiesel Series webinar in the Congenital Heart Academy uh, in association with the Fetal Gulf Heart. Uh, I'm Rima Bader, the uh, organ Professor of Pediatric and Fetal Cardiology and the course organizer. Today, we're very honored to have our group from Rush Medical University from Chicago, and we have uh, uh, three important topics. And our first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Uh, Bree Ann Muller. I hope you can join us, Bree. Uh, Bree is an uh, associate professor of uh, pediatric cardiology at Rush Medical School, and she's the program director as well. Uh, can you uh, share your screen, please? Yeah. Uh, fetal arrhythmias is always okay. a topic that needs to be readdressed and uh, readdressed again and again. Okay, how is that looking? Good? Beautiful, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for allowing me to talk to you all today. As Rima mentioned, uh, we're going to start talking about fetal bradyarrhythmias. Uh, we'll move on to tachyarrhythmias and discuss fetal pacemaker at the end with my colleagues. So um, I'm first going to touch on just ways to evaluate the heart rhythm for the fetus, go through causes of fetal bradyarrhythmias, and then briefly touch on treatment options. I have no disclosures. So. Um, we're going to start with the basics, you know, so for the fetal heart rate, by 20 weeks, the average fetus has a heart rate of about 140. Um, then it gradually decreases to about 130 um, by term. So the heart rate um, should be variable for, for a normal fetus, and the heart rate range is anywhere from 110 to even 180, um, and that can be normal. Um, and the beat to beat variation should be from five to 15. So while you're doing, you know, your fetal echo, you should be expected to see the fetal heart rate um, change uh, over the course of the echo. So now we're gonna touch on ways to evaluate the fetal heart rhythm and rate. So M mode, of course, is the first modality used. It was the first modality used for fetal echo, as we know. So it was also the first um, to be used to evaluate fetal arrhythmias. Um, and we're going to, I'm going to show you some pictures and images of examples, but um, for the end mode, just like you would do in transthoracic for the fetal, you place your cursor um, where you want to obtain your information. Um, and when we're trying to look at the fetal heart rate, we often want to look at the atrial contraction and the ventricular contraction. Um, so you're going to be placing your cursor through the atria, ideally the right atrium, um, can give you a better signal. It's a little bit thicker wall, more trabeculated um, as opposed to the left atrium, but the left atrium definitely works fine. And then either ventricle. And then you're looking at the relationship between the atrial contraction and the ventricular contraction. Um, that's going to give you a lot of information when you're looking at um, irregular rhythm. And then um, after M mode, um, pulse Doppler became used uh, to look at the fetal heart rate as we do, you know, um, that's usually the first thing that we do when you're doing your fetal echo to, to see what the heart rate is. And it's much easier and quicker just to put a pulse Doppler wave than do the M mode. Um, and so that's the most common way to evaluate the fetal heart rate. The pulse Doppler also can give you a relationship between the atria and the ventricles by putting the cursor in the LV inflow and outflow and to see the relationship there. Um, at the bottom of the screen, I just wanted to mention there is a, a, um, a less commonly used way is evaluating the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. The reversal of flow in the pulmonary vein can show you the atrial contraction. It's not as commonly done because there's um, more errors. It's not as accurate, but it is has been studied and there is uh, data on that out there. And then the third way with the Doppler to evaluate uh, not just the heart rate, but the relationship between the atria and the ventricles is to look at um, the Doppler in the SPC. <clears throat> so the, with the atrial contraction, you'll get reversal of flow in the SPC. And then you're looking at that in relationship to the ascending aorta flow. Of course, there's limitations with this. You need a very nice angle. Um, 
and your filter, your scale can't be too high. You need to pick up this very low velocity SBC flow. Um, and let me show you some examples. So this is a, a fetus at 21 weeks and three days. And this is an M mode example. So the cursor is coming down through the left ventricle, initially coming into the LV cavity, pressing over the EV valve, the atria, and then the atrium at the bottom. So that picture corresponds to the M mode on the bottom. And the red arrow is um, indicating the ventricular contraction here. So you can see we got a really nice sample. So you can see that the LV wall as it doesn't do anything, and then it contracts right here. And you can, may notice that the ventricular rate is quite slow. And it was about 50. This was a patient that we had with complete heart block. And then on the bottom, when you're looking at the atrial contraction, you're seeing these tiny little bumps that correspond with the atrial contraction. And um, there's no relationship, um, consistent relationship between the atria and the ventricle. And as we did this fetal echo, we surmised that it was complete heart block. So this is an example of M mode for evaluating the heart rate, rhythm, and also the relationship with the AB. Now, uh, these are uh, pulse wave Doppler examples. So the pictures on the left will show you where the cursor was falling. So the top example is an inflow and outflow example, where below the baseline, you're looking at the inflow and the A wave as the second wave of the inflow. And then above the baseline is the aortic outflow. So with this example, you can see that there's a nice one-to-one -one relationship with every inflow you get an outflow, and it looks like there's no delay. And then the bottom example is an example of the SPC and the aortic flow. So these tiny little bumps here is the reversal in the SPC that's going the same direction as the aortic flow. And you can measure that interval there to give you like a mechanical PR interval which is what I'm going to show you on this slide. So um, this is, in, in my practice, this is how I routinely do the mechanical PR interval is with the inflow and the outflow of the left ventricle. So below the baseline is the E and the A wave. You measure your PR interval from the beginning of the A to the beginning of the outflow. Um, this was a fetus at 16 weeks. Mom had SSA antibodies. This PR interval was 132. So it was normal, and as you can see here, it looks like every inflow corresponds with an outflow. There were no concerns on, on that. Um, what we often do, you know, with the, the inflows, the E and the A can often be really um, merged together, and it can be difficult to pull apart the, where the A actually starts. This is one uh, method where you can increase the sweep speed. So it lengthens out your... Um, your data for your inflow and your outflow. And some people like this, but they feel like they can measure the beginning of the A better. Um, this is a patient, a different patient at 36 weeks who was actually on treatment for fetal SVT. So she was on, mom was getting treatment, so the fetus was developing a prolonged PR interval. But um, we just continued to monitor that and there was no intervention needed because it was related to the medication. So this is the mechanical PR interval. And I just wanted to show um, that there was a, a, some, a study done in 2009 that actually looked at you know, how the PR interval changes throughout gestation. So that's important to remember. So on the top, you can see that based on the gestational age, um, the average PR interval earlier on in pregnancy is um, about 117. And as the pregnancy progresses to the near term, the PR interval does lengthen a few points. Um, so that's expected. And you can see the 99th percentile for a, a term fetus, the PR interval may be as high as 150, and that can be considered normal. And then down on the bottom is looking at the PR relationship, mechanical PR, to the heart rate. So it's important to remember that as the heart rate increases, the PR does shorten. So I use this a lot um, when I'm double checking that the PR interval is still within normal for the gestational age of the fetus that I'm seeing. And then I just wanna briefly touch on tissue velocity and tissue Doppler. Um, tissue velocity, similar to tissue Doppler, um, I'm showing you an example on the next slide. It's not universally available. You need to have that ability on your echo machine and most don't. 
but it has shown some utility um, when there were studies that have compared tissue velocity imaging to the mechanical peer interval that we get with pulse waves. And the tissue velocity is, is likely more accurate when they actually then looked at fetal ECG to the actual PR interval on the ECG. This is what a tissue velocity um, looks like. So similar to tissue Doppler, but it gives a nice clean line and it's showing you A is with the atrial contraction. Um, this is the isovolumic contraction of the ventricle and then the, the rest of the contraction of the ventricle. So you're putting your cursor through tissue, picking up atrial movement and ventricular movement, similar to tissue Doppler, which is this slide. Um, I just want to mention it because it is seeming to be becoming uh, used more and more. Um, Dr. Hornberger put out a study uh, in 2019 that was looking at this and found that it probably did offer some benefit to use tissue Doppler, but more for the um, tachyarrhythmias when they're trying to differentiate the type of SVT. Um, so I don't, uh, I haven't been using this a lot, but I'd love to, to hear the group's discussion at the end. We could talk about that. So then I wanted to touch on fetal ECG and fetal MCG. Now, these are things that aren't routinely done. Um, we're not able to pick up a good ECG signal from a fetus. Um, that's why it's not routinely done. Um, but we know that when we Doppler and use a PW, we're usually overestimating the, the PR um, when studies have shown um, looking at the fetal ECG compared to the Doppler on a fetal echo, that the fetal echo uh, pulse Doppler usually is overestimating the actual PR. And then that brings me to the fetal magnetocardiography. I wanted to just show you some data we have because um, we sent one of our patients up to the center at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. So we're lucky we live um, and our patients live close to Madison that we can send patients there. Um, but this is a difficult thing to be able to do because there's such a small number of centers that actually have this capability. So um, it uses magnetometers to kind of eliminate the noise um, that makes the ECG more difficult. Um, but it's, it's not like MRI where it changes um, energy states, um, but magnets are involved. And so um, fetal MCG can be incredibly useful and helpful when trying to determine um, the more details of certain types of arrhythmias, types of SVT, um, if there is long QT. You know, we're not able to identify long QT on fetal echo. We may just see bradycardia and, and two to one block. Um, so that's where fetal MCG comes in handy. There's something called the squid with the fetal MCG. Um, that, that is what's used to actually record the fetal heart signal. So let me show you some examples. And it's most accurate after 17 weeks. And it will give you information just like an EKG will give you. So this is an example of a report from the patient that we sent up there. Um, this was uh, a mom who had SSA antibodies, did not know she had them until we diagnosed the fetus with the complete heart block. So she was 25 weeks when she went up to see Dr. Strasberger. So this is courtesy of Dr. Strasberger. And um, so they do what's called runs. So there's four runs for the patient. Um, and at the top here, you'll see that they averaged out and give the average QR restoration, the RR, the QT, and the QTC. So this QTC is normal. So there was no prolonged QT for our patient. And then you can see here on the runs, the average heart rate for our patient never went above 54. Then here are some of the, the um, printouts that they give you with the report. So this is showing the fetal heart rate here. So this is the rate on, on the um, axis over here. So you can see this line corresponds with 50. So the fetus heart rate was 50 the entire time and really showed no variability. And underneath it, this is velocity is correlating to the fetus and the movement of the fetus. So as you see movement of the fetus with the red circles, there should be usually some increase of fetal heart rate, and that was not occurring for our patient. Um, and then here on the right-hand side, this is showing how they determine the atrial rate. 
and the atrial rate for this fetus was around 150 with, with um, normal variability. This is just um, the average of the different intervals that they provide in the report. So they look at the QRS duration, the QT, as I mentioned before. This example does not show the PR, but other ones will show uh, the PR interval as well. And then I just want to show a couple examples that I, I thought were, were helpful um, when thinking about fetal bradycardia. So this is the fetal MCG, a report of a patient with having blocked PACs. So um, you can see here the P core, the, the letter P is corresponding with the normal P wave here, and then a QRS, and then the P prime is the premature atrial contraction, but then is blocked. So you can see that continues to happen, a normal conduction and then a block, a normal conduction and a block. And you can see how it would give the impression with the ventricular rate of a bradycardia. And interestingly, during the MCG for this patient, the fetus went into SVT. Um, and that is shown over here with a rate of about 235. So I also wanted to talk about um, two to one block and I'm gonna have some slides comparing two to one AV block with the, the bigeminy or the blocked PACs and how you can try to differentiate the two. But um, first with the, the fetal MCG, so two to one block, AV block, is uh, often a presentation of a patient that has congenital long QT syndrome. So you can see over here the, the MCG is showing, this is a P and a QRS, and then the T wave is way over here. You can see that looks like prolonged QT. So a P, a QRS, and then the T again. So that is demonstrating the long QT. The next line is showing the two to one block. So this is a P and a P and one QRS, a P and a P and one QRS. And then this patient, uh, the average QTC was actually 580 for the fetus. Oh, and then down here, this is an example actually of T wave alternans happening on a fetal MCG. So T wave alternans is a, is a common finding with long QT syndrome. Um, and then this is a patient that actually during the MCG showed torsades. So a patient with long QT had two to one AV block, uh, went to Dr. Strasberger, and then did show torsades during the test. So. Um, Moving on, just, you know, um, this is how I kind of think about a, a patient if I see them and the heart rate seems abnormal. So first is the rate above 110 or is it below? Technically below 110 is fetal bradycardia. Um, is it just barely below 110, which it's more likely sinus bradycardia or is it quite low, 50s to 60s? Uh, that's much more likely to be a complete heart block. And is it regular or irregular? If it's irregular, it really brings into question premature contractions causing bradycardia or some type of two to one AV block. And here I just wanted to show um, the, the AHA statement, fetal statement in 2014. Um, I use this a lot as reference um, and uh, I find it very helpful. It talks about, so on the left you'll see, so sinus bradycardia causes um, types of treatment and then the level of recommendation and and the level of evidence that we have in treating these patients. And we have a good amount of evidence uh, for what to do for sinus bradycardia. But when we're starting to talk about AV block, um, the recommendations become a little bit more blurred and a little bit less clear. And it starts to become a case-by-case -case basis as to how to treat these patients. So first, just showing some examples for sinus bradycardia or low atrial bradycardia. You know, these can be related to myocarditis, possibly damage even from like SSA, SSB antibodies from mom, um, ion channel dysfunction, so that's with the long QT syndrome. And then the, the heterotaxy patients, the isomerism patients, they will show some abnormalities with the SA node and maternal medications, but that's the, the last thing to think about too. Sedatives and maternal medications can cause sinus bradycardia for the fetus. So here, this is a, a patient we saw at 21 weeks. The first fetal echo noted to have a heart rate of 84. So this is a pulse Doppler through the descending aorta. 
so that's the ventricular output, is at 84. This is the same patient, so a four-chamber view, and then looking at the inflow and the outflow for this patient. So below the baseline, you'll see the inflow, and the A wave looks quite abnormal, um, more peaked, and not what we typically see. If you remember the examples I showed you earlier, and then, but then you do have an outflow here. So it seems that the inflow and the outflow are corresponding in a one-to-one -one relationship. So it seems to be a sinus bradycardia. Another example of the inflow and the heart rate of in the in the high 80s. And then during the same test, we, we started to see some irregular beats for this patient. So this is a Doppler, another pulse wave cutting through kind of the middle of the heart beneath um, like the ductal arch. And so we're seeing this pattern of a normal ventricular beat and then what looks to be an early beat, a normal beat and then an early beat. And you may notice how high this Doppler uh, velocity is. Uh, we found this patient has severe aortic stenosis. Um, and here is a four-chamber sweep. Um, the function looks good. The LV looks like it's a little hypertrophied. Um, you'll notice the heart rate just looks slow. And um, at the very end, it may be hard to notice that there's an irregular beat there. And then two weeks later, the heart rate had completely um, increased and seemed to be a normal rate, uh, about 130s to 140s. Um, so we presumed there was sinus bradycardia due to stress from the aortic stenosis for this patient. You may notice that the LV here, um, part of the basal wall really is, is starting to thin and uh, not show as good motion. Um, that continued to worsen and then this patient actually went for a fetal intervention at Boston that went well. So this was sinus bradycardia uh, with premature, those were premature contractions, atrial contractions um, that resolved. So with sinus bradycardia, usually no treatment is necessary. You usually have to figure out what is causing the sinus bradycardia. Um, and, um, but patients usually tolerate it well without any treatment needed. Moving on to the other types of bradycardia, so two to one AV block, which commonly seen with long QT syndrome. Fetal bradycardia can also be seen with long QT. And it's important to remember that there are gestational age-based norms for the long QT. Now, of course, that's based on fetal MCG. So you're not able to determine what the Q QT interval is on the fetal echo. Uh, but usually two to one AV block, if it's due to long QT, does not need treatment. Um, you're gonna be following the patient closely avoiding any medications that can prolong the QT um, interval for mom and baby. I'll show you some examples after this slide, but I wanted to kind of talk about that in, in combination with talking about blocked atrial bigeminy. So um, blocked, so you can have blocked PACs that um, give the impression of a slow heart rate, uh, a fetal bradycardia. Usually the rates are 75 to 90. Um, but the atrial rate, of course, is going to be higher, but it's that, you know, um, the atrial beat is coming too soon that it cannot be conducted. Again, no treatment is, is usually needed for this, but about 10% of patients will develop SVT. And if you remember, I showed you that example of the NCG, that patient um, was having blocked atrial bigeminy and then went into SVT. But most patients do not, and most of the time it recovers. So this is an M-mode example showing just the blocked atrial bigeminy. So uh, if you start over here on the left side, so on the top is the ventricular contractions you'll see with, with the Vs here, and the A corresponds to the atrial contraction. Um, so this A conducts to, to this ventricular B. This A is blocked. This one conducts. This one, um, that one's blocked, and then this one conducts. So it's, it's irregular. It's often two to one, but it isn't always. So sometimes, right, you'll, you'll have a conduction and you'll have a blocked a conduction. So with the blocked atrial bigeminy, the fetal heart rate's usually um, less consistent, I have found. Um, and as opposed to second degree AV blocks, um, you'll have very regular AV intervals 
and uh, less variability in the fetal heart rate. But the fetal heart rates are about the same, usually between 70 to 90. So this is an example of second degree AB block. Um, and this is a nice example of a pulse wave up here where you have pretty consistent um, two to one. So two atrial contractions to one ventricular. And just kind of looking at it overall, the atrial beats seem pretty consistent with their regularity and the conduction to the Vs. And you can get that also on a tissue Doppler. Your tissue Doppler can be quite helpful as well. So now moving on to complete heart block. So um, the majority are either going to be immune mediated or associated with congenital heart disease. A very rare percentage are associated with um, no SSA antibodies, no congenital heart disease. It is just random. So with the SSA, SSB, uh, these deposit in the conduction system and cause fibrosis and scarring and damage to the AV node. So here's an example of a patient we had at 22 weeks. Um, so this M mode is um, slicing through the atria at the top and the ventricle down here at the bottom. And this is one example that's nice in the newer um, technology that we can do now where we can move the cursor to make it more parallel uh, how we want it to get as opposed to the older systems, right, where you couldn't even move the cursor and you were very dependent on the fetal position. Now we can move the cursor and, and get uh, the image that we want. So that, that has helped us a lot with M mode. Um, and you can see on the top, the atrial contractions, very regular, normal, about 140 to 150. The ventricular contractions on the bottom are slow at about 50. Um, so this patient already had complete heart block at 22 weeks. And then here's just a four chamber showing good function low heart rate, no effusions. This patient did really well. The fetus did develop some moderate tricuspid regurgitation towards um, into the third trimester, but did not develop any signs of high, other signs of high drop and got to near term for delivery. Here's a pulse Doppler just in the descending era showing how slow the heart rate was for this patient. It was about 50. The patient did really well. This is a second patient we had um, um, also with SSA antibodies uh, who initial echo with us. The heart rate was slow, but it was in the 80s to 90s. So we were trying to figure out what was going on with this patient, if it was sinus, if it was heart complete heart block. Um, but here's the M mode. Uh, the atrial contractions are on the top here, the vent ventricle on the bottom of the M mode. So the ventricular rate was about 72. Here, if you remember here before, it was 93. So this is the same, the same echo, the same day. So the heart rate was showing variability, but it looks like um, it was not consistent. And we were picking up here a two to one uh, AV block for this patient. When the mom was known to have SSA antibodies, so we started treatment for her. Uh, which I'll touch on next. And then I just wanted to mention the ductus venosus. So this is, can be helpful, of course, when we're evaluating for signs of, of um, heart dysfunction. But also it's important to remember that the ductus venosus will show reversal when the atrial contraction is against a closed AV valve. So um, you can see here that there's reversal in the ductus, but it's not consistent. So that's a sign um, of the, the atrial contraction against the closed AV valve as opposed to uh, cardiac dysfunction. And then I'm just about to wrap up here. So just talking about um, treatment for complete heart block, really the case-by-case -case basis. And um, you'll, you probably know every center kind of has their own um, technique and style, but um, Here's what's in the recommendations for the AHA. So um, medications to increase fetal heart rate can be considered if the heart rate is less than 55, um, particularly if you're seeing signs of stress for the fetus, signs of heart high drops that are developing. Um, we've used uh, terbutaline at our center. Uh, it's well tolerated by moms. Um, does it make any difference though? That's the question. Does it, does it affect long-term outcomes? Um, there's little data on that. 
Other treatments such as steroids and IVIG um, also can be used at the first sign of heart block, first or second degree. Um, steroids do have some complications as I listed here, but are generally well tolerated. Um, and in the AHA recommendations, interestingly, um, you know, it's, it's a high recommendation for second degree block. If you have first degree block in the fetus, you may um, only consider it if you see signs, more signs like valve regurgitation, cardiac dysfunction, effusion. Um, but I will say that I think it's more commonly used. And in our center, we definitely, if we see first degree AV block, we would definitely start treatment with steroids and IVIG um, in the hopes that we might be able to prevent the progression. Um, I have yet to see that work, in it, but um, it, there are, uh, you know, cases out there where it has, it has worked to prevent the prog progression. Um, I'm just going to keep moving along in the matter of time here. So, um, this was also just from the AHA, just talking about, you know, how do we decide about delivery for these patients? I think that can be one of the hardest things to have to decide. Um, you don't want to, of course, take the, the fetus out too early. You want them to be a good size and to be able to have a uh, pacing done. But um, you also don't want to wait too long and um, have them develop um, significant uh, hydrox which can make them more critical after delivery. So, um, you know, outcomes have really improved for these patients with complete heart block. And we think it's mostly uh, due to um, aggressive um, ICU management afterwards, starting pacing early, um, watching the moms closely, doing steroids in utero, and delivery at about 35 to 37 weeks. Um, the mortality rate has definitely gone down. Um, the University of Toronto you know, put out a study, this was a while ago, but was already showing a decrease in mortality from it was as high as 45% in the 90s to now it's much lower, down to about 50%, 15% in the early 2000s, just with all those treatment um, methods that I mentioned. Uh, so, uh, I just want to summarize, you know, the takeaways for fetal bradycardia. You know, most of the time, if you see it, it's going to be sinus bradycardia. It's much less um, likely to be a uh, heart block. Um, and really getting uh, good at the evaluation of that AV interval or the PR interval and the association between those um, is really going to be helpful. Um, to differentiate the different types of heart blocks and the arrhythmia. So that is all for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Brie, a beautiful presentation. And um, I'll open the floor for discussion for uh, a few, few seconds or minutes. Um, um, from the, uh, Dr. Silverman, do you have any questions? Sure. Um, firstly, I agree that it was a great talk um, and very comprehensive. There just two things. What is a normal QT interval in a fetus, and is there a rate and gestational variability with that? Brianne? Yes. So thank you for that question. I didn't have a slide on that. Um, we know that the QT is more prolonged in fetuses, similar to like when the in the newborn period where you see a prolonged QT, and that's typically normal, um, I'd say up to about 500 is normal. Once it gets above 500, um, that's considered abnormal. I don't have the, um, like any data on how the QT varies during pregnancy. I don't have that. Good, and uh, the other thing that I would like to ask just for the audience uh, that's here is what is the, um, the, the dose of IVIG and steroids. And do you taper your steroids later on in gestation or do you just keep it on the same level? So if you could just comment on that, I think the audience would like to hear that too. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So 
Uh, we usually do do the eight milligrams for the dexamethasone. I kind of went through it fast because I felt like I was going to uh, taking too long. But um, so we usually do start with the eight um, and then taper it down to four after a month and then leave it on four milligrams till, till term. I know not everybody does that. Um, sometimes we take off the four milligrams, of course, if we're running into complications with, especially with moms that have diabetes and higher blood sugars, that can be um, a limit for us with the steroids. Mm -hmm. I don't, the IVIG, I don't have that dose. Do you usually give them both together? One of my colleagues probably does. Um, sorry? Uh, Ray, do you usually give the steroids and the immunoglobulins together? Yes. Okay, some people will, so we'll admit steroids. mom. Yeah, we'll admit mom. Uh, so if we see, um, I have to say most of my experience has been moms already have complete heart block when we see them. But we will still admit for IVIG just in the thought that that could decrease inflammation, prevent any further um, you know, inflammation in the fetal heart, and maybe it'll help prevent high drops or help with cardiac function. So we will admit mom with IVIG uh, just for that, and then start the steroids and send her home um, on the daily steroids with, you know, weekly follow-up um, for the remainder of the pregnancy. It's very important what you said that uh, you'd continue to term because some uh, obstetricians and MFMs would not agree to keep the mom on, on DEXA till term. Uh, I do the same, I keep them till term, but uh, you always, uh, they're always so worried about uh, development of diabetes, mellitus, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, you also uh, mentioned- Bridget, this is, uh, this is Southland, hi. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful presentation and uh, you touched base on a lot of uh, uh, the basics and the more advanced uh, technology also. Uh, Norm, you asked about the dose of IVIG. I think we do the one gram per kg with a maximum of 70 grams. And uh, um, we, not too long, we had a patient with twins, pregnant with twins, and one of them had a complete heart block. We used IVIG for two purposes, to, to protect the normal uh, fetus and also uh, try to prevent further damage to the affected fetus. And uh, we used the 70 uh, grams max, um, and that was repeated three times and four weeks apart until um, I think the patient was 32 weeks, and that was it. Uh, just to answer Norm for the question about the IVIG. Thank you very so much. So 70 Tom. grams over 12 hours uh, for three weeks? Co uh, correct. That's, repeatedly. That, okay. and, and we used we used uh, four weeks apart, and we gave the patient a total of uh, three uh, doses. You mean consecutive weeks, right? You gave them for three consecutive weeks. Uh, no, we we separated the doses by four weeks. Why is that? Uh, it's it's recommended uh, okay. with uh, multiple publications. I really don't know the exact reason. However, it helps. Also, also very, very important uh, what Bree said about the development of second degree heart block uh, in a, in a um, um, SLE mo positive moms, anterior antila, and uh, how early uh, you use the treatment. And uh, even with the first degree heart block, I think this is quite uh, important. The message here is that don't wait, even if you see, because I had a case. She came with a first degree heart block and uh, within maybe six days, she developed uh, intermittent uh, second degree uh, with first and second. I started her on treatment and then she reversed after two weeks. So I think the, the, the message here is not to hesitate to treat. Do you agree to that? Uh, I mean, the, the group here? South and Bree uh, and Sydney and- uh, mm -hmm. I do, Sydney. I do agree. Actually, in the matter of fact, uh, Rima, the complete heart block can develop within hours of the yes. initial abnormal uh, rhythm or irregularity of uh, ectopic beats and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I have one further question, um, uh, Brian. Uh, what's your approach? Mm -hmm. We're talking about bradycardia now related to uh, lupus and other connective tissue disorders. 
But what do you do in, let's say, congenitally corrected transposition or left isomerism? Are you as vigorous as treating that, or do you just regard that as a hopeless case? Right. So I guess if it's sinus bradycardia, then... No, complete heart block. You mean, oh, heart block. Complete heart block associated yeah, with we, uh, left isomerism or congenitally corrected transposition. Yeah, we have had a few of those patients, and no, we did not. Presuming that we did check mom for SSA, make sure we weren't missing that she had those and happened to also have a heterotaxy patient. But if those were negative and no other signs for mom, then you're correct. We, we just watch and wait. And... Um, do you use superthermometrics in that group? We did try that once with one patient um, <coughs> and found that it didn't offer much benefit. Yeah. What um, about I you think, guys? Has yeah, any, a lot of those, yeah? Yeah. yeah, a lot of I those think, fetuses already uh, have uh, heart failure and... Uh, the, the function is down as well. So, I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it may be a, a consideration that uh, uh, you uh, can give them sympathomimetics. But I, my own uh, experience has been abysmal in that group of patients. I'd like I to mean, add one more thing you, here. You find that only in a small number, because in the survey that we conducted many years ago with Dr. Klaus Schmidt, the the almost half of them were associated with structural congenital heart disease, and I think that really is a different animal. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Mm -hmm. The anatomy is different, and the physiology is different. So, out of question to I think to treat um, isomerism with heart block uh, because the idea of steroids is trying to block the immune immune system and try to stop the process of destruction of the conducting system of the fetus. So um, I think um, there's no doubt that no one would use uh, uh, dexamethasone in, in isomerism. I think that's a consensus everywhere. I think everybody agrees to that, correct? Yes, I do. Yeah. And, and the other point is, is also uh, for, for sake of discussion, it's a beautiful talk and really, really uh, from the basics to the advanced. Uh, you mentioned something very interesting, but I'd like to go back to the slide, uh, Bri, the differentiation mm -hmm. between the um, blocked PACs and the two to one block, because the, the blocked PACs are benign and nothing will happen. But the two to one, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, it would be a, a red herring for the uh, long QT syndrome. Exactly. And it can be a challenge to, to figure it out. This is one with the two. This is the second degree AV block. This is the blocked PACs. I'd love to hear your all, you know, experience with these. With the PACs, I find that I mean, usually not, not looking at the M mode, but when you're looking at the heart, right, while you're doing the fetal echo, you can usually tell that that atria is contracting a little bit early and trying to get a beat in, just when you're kind of looking at it, um, like the atria flutters a little bit. And then, um, you know, when you're watching the fetal heart rate, either with the pulse Doppler or with the M mode, um, usually more with the pulse Doppler, I think um, you can see more of the irregularity than with the second degree AV block. But I, I'm not an expert. <laughs> And then Can we go I, back to I, the I to the two to one block? Can you go back to the two to one block? Yeah, this is the this is um. So what is the time intervals here? We, we don't have you know one. nothing is measured. Um, I I struggled finding some examples actually yeah. to show you. Um, so that's why I pulled this one up. But you can see um that the just by my eye, I'd say like the it's very regular with the distance between the two A's always. The two A's staying pretty consistent with their spacing. And then it doesn't look like this is coming to me um, early, but that's just by by my eyeballing it. Is there a pose? Is there a compensatory pose after? 
No, not with these, no. So the, can we go back to the PACs? Uh, probably there should be a compensatory mm -hmm. pulse. Yeah, so this is where you see more of the pause. Um, this is an early A, and then there's no uh, contraction. So there's the pause with the V. This one's Beautiful. conducted. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, also I've learned from you, I don't know Norman and Sousen and, and Cindy, with the AS case that there was sinus bradycardia that sort of disappeared once the LV was gone. It was really interesting. You know, even before the LV really started to deteriorate, um, the bradycardia result and the bradycardia result before the procedure. Not sure if I was clear on that. So it just resolved within weeks before the stenosis was even uh, touched. Norm, any, any idea to explain this bradycardia with the a, uh, uh, what it was moderate AS in a fetus? Yeah. I hope you're still there. I think, I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, that's my cool. rationale was that there was stress, just stress. Um, and that is definitely a list under the causes of sinus bradycardia for baby or fetus. It's just some sort of stress on the heart. Um, with right. also having those PACs. Yeah, it was a really interesting case. I was Very really worried about this patient. Yeah. It's beautiful and beautiful Doppler. Thank you so much, Brie. Mm -hmm. And we have to move mm -hmm. to our next. We, know, we must move on. Yeah, we're moving, we're moving, boss. We're moving. Um, please allow me to um, present our next speaker. Sure, Rima, uh, if you wanted, I mean, I could do the tachyarrhythmies next, but if you prefer, since we're on the um, lecture and we just got talking about bradyarrhythmias and heart block, do we want to do the pacemaker first? Or what would no, you no, 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 we would continue as is. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, uh, present Dr. Um, Cindy Tonoviski, and she is Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and the Medical Director of Congenital Ecolab at the, uh, at the uh, Rush University Medical Center. We're so honored to have the group from Rush today and we're learning quite a lot. Cindy, would you be kind enough to share your screen, please? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I literally just walked into my office. I spent two and a half hours in the yeah, car. Brie, Brie I have clinic to, right after this. Stop sharing. All right, everybody can see my screen? Sure. Okay. We're so happy that you made it the two and a half, two and a half hours. Uh -uh. Thank you. you. Know, yeah, then my little sure your heart rate shit, was a bit fast. Then I think you had sinus tachycardia then. Yeah, oh, but I'm like sweating now. Okay, so moving on from my sinus tachycardia, we're going to talk about fetal uh, tachycardia. So I'm Cindy. I'm, I'm one of the pediatric cardiologists here at Rush. And again, thank you everybody for inviting me today and uh, tolerating the sort of switch around with the the lecture talk today. So um, just a quick roadmap as far as, you know, what we're going to be discussing today. I'll just give a quick background about, you know, tachycardia and a fetus in general. Um, and then we're going to break it down into sinus tachycardia, much like Brie did with, uh, you know, sinus bradycardia. Then I will talk about the PACs. And I know Brie has already touched on that um, when talking about the heart block, but just uh, because of the association with PACs and SVT, which again, Brie has already alluded to. Um, I just wanted to talk about that briefly. And then we'll go into the fetal tachyarrhythmias, uh, both the diagnosis and the treatment. And so what we will do is um, we'll talk about the two most common ones being atrial flutter and SVT. All right. So what is fetal tachycardia? Sort of what's the definition? So this is defined as having a heart rate anywhere from uh, 160 to 180. Um, typical ranges are anywhere from 170 to 220. And that's sort of what's gonna help you define sinus bradycardia from a tachyarrhythmia, is that usually with tachyarrhythmias, as we'll see the heart rates are gonna be around 220 or above. So mild fetal tachycardia is defined as 160 to 180 beats per minute. And then severe tachycardia is described as greater than 180 in, in more than three minutes. 
And so looking at the uh, relative occurrences of this is that it happens in about every 0.4 to 1% of all pregnancies. So uh, not extremely common, but common enough. So with venal sinus tachycardia, in addition to knowing that the heart rate should be less than uh, 220, but above the normal sort of 160 to 180, uh, it should have one-to-one -one AV conduction. So that's going to be important. Um, and then there are several causes of fetal sinus tachycardia, which could be either related to mom or fetus. So um, Common maternal reasons are maternal hyperthyroidism, and this could be from active hyperthyroidism, or it could be uh, we see a lot of patients that are hypothyroid and they're in synthroid and maybe their medication is a bit too much. Um, maternal medications, anticholinergic sympath sympathomimetics, such as terbutaline, Bree talked about that a little bit. Um, and, you know, so a lot of the times I've seen patients who are in premature labor and they're in the OB floor and they are someone who needed a fetal echo for diabetes or had some sort of indication to do so. And they're like, oh, let's do it inpatient. And sometimes because of the medications they use to uh, sort of help with the premature labor, they end up causing some fetal tachycardia. Also, if mom's heart rate is high, that will affect the fetal heart rate. So if mom has an infection, she's dehydrated, she's very anxious, um, a lot of caffeine intake, those could also contribute, as well as maternal ketosis. Now, some other fetal causes are, of course, fetal infection. So again, if you know they're needing to increase their cardiac output due to infection, or things like fetal hypoxia or fetal anemia, where again, you need to increase the cardiac output, they will be tachycardic. Um, interestingly, I found an article that cites that certain chromosomal abnormalities can be associated with more with sinus tachycardia than other things, and they uh, noted trisomy 13 in Turner's. So when it comes to fetal sinus tachycardia, you have one-to-one -one conduction, you have a heart rate that's less than 220, but higher than 160. Uh, you want to try to identify the cause if you know it, and then treat it appropriately. So uh, this here is uh, a picture I borrowed from the below article. Um, and as you can see, there is one-to-one -one conduction. So atrioventricular, atrioventricular. And I'm glad, again, Bree did her lecture first because she explained all these M modes and how it's obtained and, and what all the little blips mean. Um, but when the heart rate was measured, um, it was measuring at 190 beats per minute. So when you're looking at this and you're scanning the fetus and you're like, oh, the heart rate looks high and you're seeing one-to-one -one conduction, but a heart rate in the 190s, low 200s, you think more sinus tachycardia than a fetal tachyarrhythmia. Uh, this is another patient uh, from an article I borrowed um, done by Dr. Uh, Barbara Perillo, who I actually had the pleasure of working with at one of my community hospitals for a few years. But this was a patient where uh, they were doing the Doppler and noted um, the fetal heart rate. So as Bree mentioned, you can use M mode or you can actually use Doppler. And this is where they were doing the heart rate and they get a fetal heart rate again of about 190. And interestingly, um, this patient was then found to be hyperthyroidism and they were able to treat the fetal sinus tachycardia with propylurosil. This is a patient I personally saw at one of my community hospitals. And as I was scanning, um, you can kind of see throughout this video is it looks like at some points the heart rate kind of goes a little bit fast and it just kind of caught my eye. So um, I was like, oh, this, you know, seems a little bit faster than I normally see for a baby that I'm scanning at 31 weeks. And when I did the outflow Doppler, I got a heart rate of 176 beats per minute. So this is a patient that again, this is sinus tachycardia in that mild range that we talked about. Um, when I sort of asked the patient about, you know, anything going on, it seemed like, you know, she had been a little under the weather recently, maybe a little dehydrated. So we talked about things like decreasing caffeine intake, bringing in more fluid. And when I saw her back a couple of weeks later, the fetal heart rate had gone down to normal. So now I want to briefly talk about the fetal PACs because Bree did talk about them as well. But these are uh, also a very common thing to see in fetal life in about 1% to 2% of all pregnancies. And of course, then we're seeing them a lot in the prenatal, um, in the postnatal period in newborns as well as infants. Um, and usually these are very uh, benign and self-limiting. And as Bree showed, PACs can be conducted or non-conducted. And 
as she talked about, the non-conductive ones are the ones where, you know, the, it can sort of mimic a fetal bradycardia, whereas um, the conductant ones will not. It'll sort of more have a normalish heart rate. These are more common after 28 weeks gestational age, but it can occur any time. And again, as I said, most have a good prognosis. You can have self-resolution within fetal life or soon after delivery. Um, typically, if I'm finding this in fetal life, I might get an EKG on the baby after they're born. Um, and if it's still audible after birth, do like a halter to assess the uh, PAC burden. Most of these are idiopathic, um, but can be associated obviously with some of the same factors as fetal sinus tachycardia, particularly caffeine intake, hydration, illness. Um, but also can be associated with some underlying structural defects, um, most notably an aneurysmal atrial septum, which I've cited below, and I'll show you some pictures as well. Uh, and again, why I talk about PACs here, even though it's not specifically a tachyarrhythmia, is that 1% of fetuses that have frequent PACs, so usually not with infrequent PACs, can progress to SVT. So this was a patient I had seen, um, and if you're looking at this other than when the video sort of goes to reboot, you can sort of see where the heart kind of has that little compensatory pause. Um, and so this was a patient that I was suspecting was having PACs. Uh, I want you to also note, interestingly, much like the article, again, this is not the patient from the article, is that you can see how the atrial septum is bulging into the left atrium. And so it's possible that sort of that septum hitting some sort of ectopic focus within uh, the left atrium may be contributing to the PACs. So this was the Doppler I took. So again, this was the um, inflow outflow. And right there, that's the inflow. And so we can see here that uh, that is our PAC. And how do we know it's a PAC? Number one, it's happening early. Um, and then what happens there is the uh, sort of the, um, the Doppler waveform sort of changed. It became sort of longer and skinnier. And then the subsequent uh, ventricular beat is different as well. So you see it happened early and then it's sort of a different size and maybe not really a different shape, but it's definitely a different size than all the other subsequent normal ventricular beats. Um, and so uh, this was my patient with the PACs before. I brought her back at 35 weeks. And again, now here's using MO to look at fetal PACs. And that is the atrial contraction. So from this little screen here, you can see that the ventricles at the top and the atria is at the bottom. So this is going to be your atrial contraction. And as you can see, it looks nice and regular. And now here it's happening early, but also notice the shape is different as well. If it was coming from the same focus, it should sort of have the same sort of general shape to it. And I think Brie used a slide very similar to this um, with hers, the blocked PACs. So again, this is a fetus, um, and I borrowed this from the article below, um, which is again with that atrial septal aneurysm case, um, is that the fetus heart, fetal heart rate was noted to be a little low, it was around 100. Um, and so uh, from end mode, you're able to see that while the ventricular rate, yes, is slow at 100, why is that? Um, because you're having your atrial beat and then your PAC, and then you sort of have this dropped beat here before the normal atrial rate comes back. And then you have your PAC happening early that does not conduct and you lose your ventricular beat. So those are sort of the blocked PACs. Again, this is not part of the tachyarrhythmias. It will sort of mimic the bradyarrhythmias, but just wanted to talk about it here for completeness sake the PACs. When it comes to fetal PACs, Again, most of these don't need any treatment, um, but what you really want to do is counsel mom to refrain from things like taking too much caffeine, caffeine um, you know, smoking, uh, you know, sort of decreasing or, you know, not taking any beta mimetic medications, and of course, proper hydration if she's ill, making sure that, you know, she treats herself appropriately with antipyretics if needed. Um, when PACs are infrequent, meaning I just am seeing a couple throughout the exam, I usually don't necessarily follow up. Again, a lot of these are happening at later gestation. So usually they're being uh, seen frequently by their OB and getting fetal heart, the Doppler. So I assume if it's starting to increase, it would be picked up in clinic and they could always come back. And I sort of always allude in my note to the uh, 
MFM or the OB that, hey, if you're hearing it again, please send it back. But if they're frequent, I do follow usually every two to four weeks. Now, if there are infrequent PACs, but they're rather early in gestation, then I usually do a follow-up just because, again, um, as the pregnancy progresses, it's possible that those PACs increase in frequency. And again, the reason why I was talking about this is that when there's frequent PACs, the development of SVT can occur. So now I'm going to talk about the fetal tachyarrhythmias um, individually. So first we're going to talk about fetal SVT, and this is the most common fetal tachyarrhythmia. So this makes up about anywhere from 70 to 90% of all tachyarrhythmias. And most like most commonly, it's caused by an AVRT, so an AV node reentry tachycardia. But other causes are ectopic atrial tachycardia and PJRT. Um, and so those don't happen very frequently, um, but they can. And why it's important to treat SVT is, you know, much like our pediatric patients, you know, fetal patients they can tolerate being an SVT for quite some time—a couple days, um, maybe even a week. Um, but then after a while, they can start to develop fetal high drops. So you want to treat to prevent the fetal high drops because there's a higher mortality risk for a hydropic fetus, which is as high as 35% versus 4% in a non-hydropic fetus with SVT. So high drops is more likely to occur when uh, several things are present. So one, if the arrhythmia is present at an earlier gestational age, and this could be from two factors. One, just the fact that if this is starting at 18 weeks, you have, you know, another, uh, you know, 22 or um, another 12 weeks where, or I'm sorry, 18 weeks, another 22 weeks where the baby can potentially be going in and out of SVT um, and more likely to progress to high drops. The other thing is that if it's happening in early gestational age, so if you think about that 18 weeker, you have to think like they're not seeing their OB as frequently as someone who is developing it at later gestations. So they're more likely to be sitting in it and nobody ever knowing. Um, SVT uh, is more likely to cause fetal high drops when the rate is really high, so 220 to 240. So if you're hitting even above that, um, that's going to be uh, more likely to cause high drops. And usually if you have SVT that's difficult to treat or incessant, so you're treating, 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 but it's not getting better um, and you're not just able to break it. Um, and sometimes when this is occurring, you're more likely to have those other less common arrhythmias like PJRT and ectopic atrial tachycardia as the cause more than, more than an AD node reentry tachycardia because those two are also known to be very difficult to treat postnatally. Okay, so overall, when it comes to SVT, you don't wait, you treat. So this is a patient, unfortunately, this is not the best picture. Um, so this was a patient, again, at one of my community hospitals I work at, and they had went to their OB and the heart rate was noted to be fast. So they sent her to LMD, MFM evaluated her, and again, uh, with ultrasound felt they were an SVT. So they called at night for fetal echo, and my sonographer went in, and she was uh, rather difficult to image, but as you can see here, you can appreciate, um, number one, just how fast the atria is moving. Okay, so this is the left atrium. And you can literally see it sort of quivering and shaking here. Um, and then you can notice that also the LV function isn't really as brisk as it should be. It's, it's rather kind of just shaking there as well. Um, no high drops was developed yet, um, but this was a patient due to it being at a community hospital. Um, because with the concern for the LV function um, and what I thought could be a quick development of high drops, I transferred her to our downtown campus. Um, and this here uh, was the, um, the Doppler, the M mode. So note the one-to-one -one conduction again. So this is gonna sort of help determine this from another tachyarrhythmia flutter. Um, and again, the fetal heart rates are 220 to 240. So while uh, fetal sinus tachycardia also has one-to-one -one conduction, it's really going to be the heart rate that separates the, the actual heart rate number value that is going to help separate from a fetal tachyarrhythmia from a sinus tachycardia. And now this patient actually did really well. By the time uh, the ambulance got her to downtown Rush, the fetus spontaneously converted to normal sinus rhythm and remained uh out of SVT for the rest of the pregnancy, we followed her closely. And while occasionally the heart rate did go fast, um, it returned to normal and the, the baby did well after birth. 
This is a patient that we had seen um, at our downtown campus. So this is also an SVT patient who uh, you can clearly see is hydropic. So uh, you can see the atria moving at a very fast rate, the decreased LV function, and you can also see the significant pericardial fusion here. And you're also seeing some fluid in the abdomen. If I had other pictures showing, you know, just the overall fetus, there was fluid um, everywhere. So um, this patient, due to the uh, high drops and the difficulty of treating a fetus with high drops, we actually sent her to our uh, colleagues over at Lurie Children um, for a couple different reasons. Number one, um, they have an electrophysiology team. Unfortunately, we don't um, on campus. And, you know, these are patients that will require significant uh, therapy as I'll show you guys here. So when it comes to treating SVT, um, the difference uh, between the two is whether there's high drops or not high drops present. But either way, once you diagnose SVT and you're going to treat, um, mom needs to be admitted inpatient um, because we have to treat her inpatient because the medications we will be giving her can cause toxicity, arrhythmias, and we really need to keep a close eye on mom. Um, and sometimes what there will be is uh, usually adult ET may be on consult for these patients as well. So they have to be monitored on a telemetry floor. Um, usually most uh, OB floors can do telemetry. If not, you might wanna consider uh, doing it on a floor that has telemetry, whether it's the cardiology floor, um, an ICU setting. And you get a baseline EKG and baseline electrolytes on mom. Then once you have all of that, you want to, uh, if there's no high drops, you're going to start with single therapy. So usually you want to load with digoxin. And this total loading dose over 24 hours is 1,200 to 1,500 micrograms. So you just want to divide that Q8. How you divide that um, doesn't totally matter, but you want to get the full dose. And usually I would do like 500, 500, 500. And then you go to maintenance dosing of anywhere from 250 to 500 micrograms twice a day. You want to monitor the ditch drop levels um, and monitors mo monitor mom's EKG. So you want to look at the trough levels because number one, you want to look if it's too low and the fetus is not converting, you know, you maybe you're going to go up on your ditch. The other thing is if it's too high, you want to decrease the ditch medication so you don't cause any toxicity for mom. And then the EKG also just monitors for any concerns for ditch toxicity. Now, if after two to three days, you don't get any resolution, you usually want to add a second agent, and that's typically, typically flecainide. Um, and so uh, the only difference then is when uh, there's high drops versus no high drops, um, is that when there's high drops present, again, that's very difficult to treat because everything we are treating mom with um, goes through the placenta. And when you have significant high drops, it's going to make absorption of the medication from the baby much more difficult. So you always want to start with dual therapy. So that's going to be your loading dig dose along with the maintenance and then your adding fuck and And unfortunately, I don't um, have the doses off the top of my head. Um, but in some, some cases, you do need to add a third agent, and this can be either amiodarone or sodalol. And I um, really haven't seen that used very much, um, but it's there if you need it. So once you convert the fetus to normal sinus rhythm, you really want to do close follow-up. So how we typically do it is initially they're getting some sort of ultrasound twice a week. So they'll see MFM, you know, on Monday or Tuesday, and then they say us, you know, Thursday or Friday, um, and they were constant, constantly monitoring the heart rate of the fetus. So we want to see, is the baby going back into the arrhythmia? So we're visibly seeing it. Um, usually try to scan for anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to make sure you're monitoring for a good amount of time to see if the baby's going in and out of it. And then you want to assess for high drops. So if you had a baby that had high drops, you want to see, number one, is it resolving or getting better? Um, the other thing is, if you are seeing high drops developing, that may be a clue that when the baby is not being monitored, let's say, you know, they're being seen twice a week, while they're not being seen in the hospital and they're at home, the, it's very likely the baby is going to SVT and staying in there more frequently than what you're actually seeing with your eyes. So you want to assess the fetal heart rate and the PR interval in addition to the rhythm using the Doppler, the M mode. Um, and the other thing while you're measuring the PR interval is that um, typically uh, the medications you use to treat and the one that I see sort of happening, this most happening most with this, the flecainide, is that could increase your PR interval. 
So if you're noticing uh, a baby is a Ramazan significant therapy and you're starting to see the fetal heart rate drop, you know, less than 130 uh, consistently or the heart, the PR is kind of creeping above the 150 mark, you may want to consider decreasing um, some of the medications. Most institutions um, in these situations will send mom with like a home fetal Doppler so she can just measure the heart rate at home and, you know, alert anybody if she's noticing the heart rate being above 220 again. Continue to monitor your digital levels for mom um, and then monitor electrolytes as needed. So uh, usually with DIG, you don't necessarily need to do a whole lot of um, monitoring with the electrolytes, but if you're on flaconide, you probably do want to check magnesium levels. Um, and make sure that those are not, because um, some, some moms, when they're on second on their magnesium, down, they need to be on magnesium supplementation. Um, and that can sometimes be a, a little tough for them because it can cause, you know, diarrhea. And so if you're able to come down on the medications and then come down on supplementation, that would be uh, ideal. So um, I try to, when I have these patients, get moms on single therapy with just, just DIG. Um, if I'm able to. And then you want to anchor delivery as close to term as possible. Obviously, if you have a severely hydropic uh, infant and you're not able to really treat that well, um, then you may have to deliver um, because the high drops can worsen and you can have intrauterine fetal demise. So this is a patient um, that I had seen. This is a post-treatment. So this was an interesting case. So this was a, a mom who uh, came to, again, one of my community hospitals. Um, it was found to be an SVT with high drops at 27 and a half weeks gestational age. So um, I didn't get a chance to scan her initially because um, I wasn't on site, but I looked at the MFM images and it was very clear it was some type of fetal tachyarrhythmia with significant high drops. And again, because of the level of care this baby would need, as well as the difficulty of treating SVT with high drops. Uh, she was transferred again to our Lurie team um, with the EP uh, sort of guidance as well. So this fetus was uh, sort of rather difficult to treat again, I think just because the high drops were so significant that, you know, mom was started on DIG and flaconide, but they also did a fetal IM injection of DIG. And I'm not um, as well versed in that, but, you know, they, they just really needed to to break the fetus. And I know they had me uh, updated and they kind of were telling me that you know, it was kind of, oh, converted to normal sinus rhythm and then was sort of going back to SVT. Um, and I think that's what sort of prompted them to do the IM fetal injection to sort of hopefully just break it and keep it broken. So the baby converted to normal sinus rhythm consistently, not going back and forth around 29 weeks and mom was hospitalized that entire time. Um, and then we followed her as an outpatient. So this is when I first saw her back um, at 32 weeks. Um, she, I think she saw her, her, had her first couple appointments at the Lurie team. And as you can see, the, the fetal heart rate is much better. We're not in an arrhythmia. You do see that there is still some pericardial effusion, but it was much improved. And all of the other ascites and fluid had improved significantly. And by the time the mom got to term and delivered, uh, all of the high drops had resolved, including the pericardial effusion. Now, this was one where um, the fetus was, the heart rate was starting to go in the 120s um, and the PR interval was creeping in the 150s. So we eventually were able to, from week 32 until she delivered, wean her off the flaconide and keep her on single dip therapy of digoxin. So the other common um, fetal, uh, fetal tachyarrhythmia is atrial flutter. So Brie, this, how long more, Brie? How long I just more? got two more slides. I'm almost okay, done. Great, thank you. I'll thank go you. through this really fast. So um, it's less common than fetal tachyarrhythmia. So it makes up the rest of the cases. And the one thing to note is that the AB node is not part of the reentrant circuit. So this is where um, you'll have a rapid atrial rate and the AV, uh, sort of that extra atrial beat does not necessarily conduct to the ventricle. Um, so while you'll have rates similar to what you would see with SVT, the way you're gonna determine between the two is looking at the conduction block. So two to one conduction block accounts for majority of the cases and the rest are three to one or four to one block. And some of these can be associated with chromosomal abnormalities or structural CHD, which I've listed there, um, ABSD, hypoplast, pulmonary atresia, Epstein's is a very common one. 
And again, um, if untreated, uh, the fetal high drops rate is about 40% and fetal demise can be as high as 10%. So again, this is a picture I just borrowed from this Jakey article. Um, and so while you are measuring a heart rate and getting 220s to 240s, what you're gonna see different from the SVT is it's not one-to-one -one conduction. You're gonna have two atrial beats for every ventricular. And I think we had that discussion um, with Breeze is that, you know, how do you know if it's PACs? It should be the regularity of where the atrial contractions are happening. They shouldn't be having one really close to one another. Um, for treatment of flutter, this is my last slide, is that initially treatment is similar to SVT when no high drops is present. So you admit mom, you do all the uh, pre-op uh, pre-treatment testing. And again, you load with DIG, same dosing, um, same maintenance. And again, if in two to three days, there's no conversion, rather than using uh, flecainide, you're going to use sodalol. That seems to work better for flutter. I'm not exactly sure why, but um, studies have just shown that tends to work better. So your initial dose is about 80 milligrams, and then you can go up to 160 milligrams BID as needed. And then again, uh, adjust the dig as needed based on the trough. And then as you do the monitoring, same as you would do SVT, sending them home, try to uh, you know get down to single therapy if possible. Um, and then if high drops is present, again, it's gonna be very similar to what I said above for single treatment for non high drops and with SVT with high drops is that you do initial therapy with uh, dual therapy, so DIG and Sotolol. So rather than the DIG and Flecanon, you're going to use DIG and Sotolol. And again, this is requiring close follow-up. All right, so um, any questions? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I know we're kind of running short on time, but anybody have any questions for me? Okay, um, beautiful. Thank you so much, Cindy. I've learned quite a lot. I think the, the, the thing that we have, the message to the, to the uh, audience here, and I hope that the rest of the panel will, uh, will, will, will share, how are you going to give the dig? Uh, because uh, a lot of people will just, I was trained to do it orally. Some people mm -hmm. give it IV, some give it, people give it IM. The question here is because um, I usually feel safer with oral and um, I'm not sure also if you would admit the, the, the mother or not, because you have to do electrolytes, which is very important. With People don't do a baseline ECG to the mother to check for arrhythmia than the mother to, before starting anti medication, mm -hmm. plus electrolytes, and you can do set magnesium, which we tend to forget, usually mm -hmm. look at calcium and, and whatever. So what is the consensus? Would you admit or would you trust and treat as our patient? Yeah, or, and how is, do you do loading for everybody as part of the institutional policy or what? Thank you. Yeah, like I said, we we load and I usually do oral unless for some reason mom can't take oral or, you know, she's vomiting a lot or something. If she's got a lot of emesis, you know, who knows. But usually I try to stick to oral just because, again, I'm more comfortable with it. Um, and then usually we, we do admit in these cases. I don't okay. know how everybody else does at their institutions. But. No matter how, how confident we are, we need to monitor the mother because you don't know how the and also how they will respond. Thank you for making sure that you take the trough level, which is 30 minutes before the next dose, because sometimes people uh, don't, don't, don't know when to take the levels and it will reflect on the, uh, on the, on the mother. Uh, I think we will uh, leave the questions to the end and move to our last but not leave, least. Uh, hang on a minute, Rima. I just want to make uh, uh, two points. Uh, the first is that I have a strong preference for intravenous or intramuscular digoxin, and I'll tell you why. Because the absorption in pregnancy is pretty lousy. And so I think that uh, the one important issue is to get the digoxin into the stores first, because digoxin is absorbed into the stores as far as pharmacology is concerned. And uh, it's much uh, more reliably done when you give a parenteral rather than an enteral dose of the digoxin. So my preference has always been to do high um, maintenance uh, 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 initial doses and start off with intravenous or intramuscular. Intravenous is much more pleasant for the patient. And 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 I've, I've had a lot of success with digoxin. Uh, the other question that I would like uh, to Norm, ask loading is, or maintenance you give? I do both. Until so you I, load I, IV and then I'm maintain? If I'm successful, I may convert to oral. No, no, okay. when you give IV, would you load IV and then maintain yes. IV? Or... Yes. 
And I was instructed to do that by an adult electrophysiologist with whom I worked, Jerry Griffin. Now, uh, the other question is, there's, there's this big controversy which uh, Cindy's managed to um, avoid by using her own experience, which is good enough. But the question is, Ditch first or Sotolol first? What is, what is the current feeling and how do we tell our participants uh, that uh, they may have a choice? That's a good question. Yeah, I've never, I've, I've just always, like I said, personal experience and how I was trained. And then even like um, we follow a protocol that our literary EP team, and that's, that's sort of what they've always suggested to us was, you know, just always starting with ditch first, but I'd be interested to hear what everybody else does. Um, if they've tried and had good success with using um, the second agent first, as opposed to the ditch. Samson, what's your experience? Oh. Well, I, I can answer. Samson, yeah, what's can your you experience? Would you use dish first or Sotolol first? And based on what? We use dish first uh, because Sotolol requires, it's, it's, it's a big gun, and we leave it as a last resort, resort if we cannot control the tachyarrhythmia. Uh, and and my 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 own experience and my protocol is we we'll start with dish and then follow it by glyconide if we need a second agent and then third at sotolol uh, if needed. But um, that's that's what I usually do. I think the reference is the uh, Edward Yegi studies with uh, the one that you present. I did they use dish first, right? Or yeah. sotolol? Yeah, I think they used uh, dish and then uh, sotolol. And flaconide was third, if I recall correctly. Um, people are a bit afraid of the subtle because of the um, fetal death that can happen. But he, he, he mean, uh, what, what I heard from him and from others, that um, they're very happy of using subtle with digoxin. Yet my experience is that mothers tolerate uh, flaconide better than subtle I'm not sure if this is the experience of others. Yeah. I haven't had used it all often, so um, I don't have as much experience with it. Um, but yeah, moms I've had on a and I've seen them tolerate it fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank just you so much. So we... a, may, I ha may I just have one more question, please, Prima? Yes, and boss. This is the, uh, I can tell you my own experience is that um, if you have a resistant tachycardia, uh, then the use of amiodarone. Uh, is obviously one that you consider as a third choice. Um, I've had bad luck with amiodarone uh, because um, I've had a successful treatment of arrhythmia uh, with complete, uh, as, as we finished giving an, an intravenous dose, the patient was reverted to, the fetus reverted to sinus rhythm. But when we referred the patient back to the ward, uh, half an hour later, the fetus died, oh. and I think that um, that um, uh, amiodarone is a difficult agent. And I would want to know for the panelists, for the review, uh, from the panelists, for the audience, is what is the wisdom that they have with the treatment of amiodarone, and do you stop other agents? Uh, do you give it intravenously? Do you give it uh, uh, into the umbilical cord? What is your uh, preference for amiodarone? I, I've never had to use amiodarone in fetal um, life, but I know when I've done it um, in like postnatal babies, uh, typically when I've switched to amio, I'm usually stopping a lot of the other stuff and just doing single dose with amio. So, I mean, if I had to go that route, um, I think I would probably just use single single therapy amio. Mm -hmm. But I've never had to actually use it in fetal life thus far in my five-year career. <laughs> um, uh, Sousen and Bree, what do you think? Susan? Hear me, guys? Yes, I, I never used amiodarone in fetal life. I uh, get a lot concerned about uh, prolongation of the QTC, et cetera, particularly if the patient, if I started the patient earlier on uh, digoxin. So I really don't, never thought of using amiodarone, to be honest. 
Well, I can well, tell you, I've used it twice and twice. I've had fetal demise, and uh, I think. Well, that did you? I, did you? Did you? Did you have the patient on the Jackson earlier? Yeah, it had been on anyhow? other other agents. That's probably the reason, because you know it messes up the the absorption of the Jackson, and uh, probably that was one of the reasons, and that's why I shy away from using it as uh, my protocol to use Dijoxin first. So I usually do not add amiodarone in my- I'm, I'm, I'm an old fashioned list. guy and I believe that you're correct. I think that uh, one of the reasons why Dijoxin has taken a bad rap is that people don't load the patient with the sufficient uh, dose. Uh, and um, I, I think uh, that uh, amiodarone is a great agent. It works well. But it, my my own feeling about when it has to be used is that it's best to give it to the mother orally rather than intravenously or uh, into the umbilical vein. And yeah, also I think consideration the... of changing the other medication doses or use a single therapy as uh, Cindy has suggested. Right. Well, the basic of, of antiarrhythmic treatment is that when you, you introduce and you withdraw, uh, so you, you mean you cannot really uh, withdraw and then in, introduce, right? Because the drug levels are different. So if you want to load, as we do postnatally, if you wanted to add amio, load a patient who's not responding, you load with amio and then maintain, but you gradually uh, uh, decrease the other, the first medication or the second. So this is my practice is that we have to be very cautious with when you introduce, you don't stop uh, uh the previous med uh, immediately. Uh, with the uh, use of, of the third medication, let's, let's mention this is according to the guidelines and also what we know is the high drops. So this is when you really have to, uh, or, or really uh, uh, one of the complex uh, tachyarrhythmia is not responding to the usual. So it's not a usual thing, but I've seen it and I've, um, I didn't use it, but when I was with Dr. Huta, he used it frequently and um, his protocol was to introduce it as a third medication, and um, and uh, he was happy. Everybody else was a bit worried, but he was happy, and patients did well. And it did for, but not as an immediate resort, as a very last resort. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank so you. So can very we much move to our last speaker? Thank you so much, um, uh, Sausen. Uh, we have a uh, 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 Sausen Award from. Uh, uh, the same institution, and uh, Sausen is a professor of pediatric uh, and um, uh, obstetrics and gynecology at Rus Rus Rush University Medical Center and Rush University Children's Hospital. She's going to talk to us about a very interesting topic that we have not ever discussed before in the fetal series uh, over the past two years. Thank you so much, Sausen, for accepting the invitation. Please share your screen. Yeah, I, I did share my screen. Do you guys see it? Yeah. All right. Thanks for the invitation, Rima and, uh, and team. Uh, really excited to present this uh, topic today. Uh, and it's about the fetal pacemaker who have no disclosures. So I'm just, uh, uh, as pre we presented today, the fetal bradycardia, um, it's, it, it makes sense that fetal pacemaker uh, idea would be uh, interesting to help those fetuses with significant fetal high drops and, uh, and poor outcome out of that. The other, the, the other thing of, uh, of using fetal pacemaker or thinking about fetal pacemaker is um, the, the small uh, market for it. So you can imagine the number of fetuses presenting with uh, bradycardia significant enough to, uh, to cause fetal high drops. Um, uh, and, and how can you market something like that? However, I looked into the literature and the earliest attempt I, uh, I was able to uh, find was in 1986. And it was actually um, uh, performed on a human fetus and I can, uh, I was able to identify one of the uh, familiar names in Dr. Uh, Strasberger that happened in uh, Houston, Texas. And it was a 27 week uh, fetus with congenital complete heart block with severe high drops. They reported that the heart rate was uh, 32 and um, 
and the discussion with the family was that no other, um, uh, you know, entrance ramp fetal demise is going to be imminent. So they they put a single lead pacing into through the mom's abdomen to the uterus to the uh, fetal thorax and introduced it to the right ventricle of the fetus. And they started pacing at a rate of what, 120. They had a good capture. Uh, of course, the other end of the of the um, lead was connected to an external pacing, and uh, they were able to uh, create that uh, heart rate of 120. It seems like uh, after uh, four hours of this procedure, there was intratranchetal demise. Uh, the explanation that they provided was really uh, not not so clear. However. It was one of the possibilities uh, was that it was too late, the heart rate was too low, and and or um, that they started pacing uh, all of a sudden on a higher rate. So the fetus heart rate went from 32 to the 120 via the pacing leads, and that was was one of the reasons they uh, they thought might lead to the intracranial fetal demise. The second attempt was in from UK, and I think that was in 1994, um, in uh, a very similar situation of uh, maternal lupus, uh, congenital heart block, and severe high drops. And they did uh, uh, introduce the pacing wire, but via a transvenous uh, uh, approach through the, the like from the abdomen, the abdomen of the mom to the uterus to the umbilical cord, it's very similar to the way they used to get the fetal blood sampling. Uh, they were able to uh, also uh, pace the heart. There, there's no clear uh, data about what was the outcome. However, uh, it's it's probably no success uh, for survival of this fetus either although they were able to create a capture of uh, on a higher uh, heart rate. Um, then in 2003, this is like a, a little uh, moving forward. I, uh, I, there was a single study from uh, Dr. Mark Ovadia. He was one of my attendings actually as a fellow here at University of Chicago. And he did um, use an animal model to just prove the concept. Uh, of pacing uh, and, and creating a pacemaker uh, for uh, a fetus. So he used uh, rats as a model, and he used a single uh, lead pacemaker connected to the outside uh, generator, and he used this lead in, in pacing uh, 11 animals and was successful in uh, capturing and creating a faster heart rate on 10 of them. But I didn't see uh, more of these studies. This has uh, occurred in the na our neighbor uh, institution, University of Illinois, just across the street from us. Uh, in the same year, in 2003, there was a team from Brazil. They went to uh, ahead and tried um, also uh, a, a single lead fetal pacemaker uh, that was a fetus with congenital complete heart block. However, there was another other uh, uh, congenital heart disease in the form of left atrial isomerism and uh, AVSD. They did the transabdominal transuterine approach and they placed the tip of the lead onto the LV. Uh, they were able to record some uh, increase of the um, of the fetal heart rate. And uh, unfortunately, uh, fetal demise occurred uh, uh, like 36 hours after the procedure. At the autopsy, they were uh, they identified significant pericardial effusion, uh, and they relate the demise to that significant pericardial effusion, which uh, believed to be secondary to the approach they used and uh, created that effusion. So this this group from um, the University of Southern California in LA, uh, they were pretty consistent 
and they published multiple uh, publications uh, starting from 2012 to 2019, and they really attempted to get this uh, wonderful uh, idea of having a fetal pacemaker. So they launched their uh, efforts together, and you can see it's a, a, a combination between the School of Engineering and Pediatric Cardiology uh, teams and create to create this because as a pacemaker to create a pacemaker you definitely need that uh, it's a, a big portion of it is related to uh, engineering and uh, biochemistry because you need this battery uh, formation to be uh, suitable for the small size you're looking for so they used um, uh, uh, they, the, their goal was to create an injectable pacemaker, which is very similar to what we use, for example, in uh, to the uh, the devices like the ASD device or so that it get it gets uh, uh, mounted on a cable and then you get uh, deploy the device afterwards. So this is their idea. So uh, they used uh, in the study in 2012 an animal um, model uh, as an adult rabbit. They thought this is a very similar size of the acetal heart, particularly towards the end of gestation. And then subsequently, once they uh, created a prototype, they used it on a pregnant use. Uh, they used a substitute approach uh, to, to introduce the, the device into the myocardium. Their device is basically a cylindrical shape, which is very similar to what we know. And it's a relatively new technology of a leadless pacemaker that has been used in adults where you inject it into the RV and leave it there. Uh, so this is, I'm going to show you some uh, pictures of that. And, and they have the rechargeable lithium uh, cell battery and the the injectable pacemaker device is uh, has a uh, corkscrew electrode that gets uh, uh, wired or uh, uh, you know uh, screwed into the RV uh, trabeculation. Um, so then in in, in 2013 under the same group and I'm just showing you some of the how the their uh, uh, pacemaker device looks like, and this is mounted into the cable that will introduce it. And you can see this is the spiral, and that will be screwed into the RV uh, um, trabeculation. And um, they kept modifying the the device, but actually it's more into the uh, the engineering portion to create a more appropriate, um, uh, you know, delivery of of impulses and uh, and and decreased uh, tissue injury and all that stuff. Mm. You can see down here is uh, a picture of after they used the device, they just uh, opened the the animal and uh, retrieved the device, and they reported that there was no significant injury uh, around the site of placing the device. Uh, so they, uh, they actually um, have at the 2019, this is a picture of their cable, uh, how to inject the injectable, I would say, the, in, in the insertion cannula. Uh, and this, this is how they mount, they put the device in and then they inject it into their animal. I didn't see any uh, trials yet on human fetuses, uh, but I, I I was really impressed with the significant uh, effort and persistency of uh, of their group working together and creating uh, this um, uh, device. And actually, um, let's move on to what we think of an ideal uh, fetal pacemaker looks like. It should definitely be a leadless device. Because you don't want with the movement of the fetus to the fetus to be entangled in all of this leads and then get a lot of uh, injuries. It has to be a small device and it should be amenable to print uh, catheter delivery, as we noticed in this group from uh, California. And it should be a self-retaining mechanism without with a remote programming. And there is uh, it should have no external uh, uh, battery or 
connected to an external device. It should be a whole device uh, uh, like placed and left there, and it could be uh, remotely programmed. Uh, the other important point is this um, uh, group of fetuses with complete heart block that would require a fetal pacemaker to survive is a pretty small uh, group uh, to market a device uh, for, and it's going to be a very burdensome for companies to accept the idea mm. uh, to, to create, the, to pay the money and support to, at the end, create a device that it will be used by a very small um, group of, of patients. Uh, so the other uh, thought would be if the technology that will be applied as a fetal pacemaker could be used also to a wider age range, like from fetus to adults, and, and, and that will make it more lucrative from the marketing standpoint. So with that said, um, let's talk a little bit about, we, we all know about the current pacemaker deficiencies. We have the device and battery size, which is definitely going to be not suitable for children, needless to say, for fetuses. And the, uh, the leads of the pacemakers with a lot of uh, uh, injuries that can happen into the fetus, if we think of and then the surgical incisions that require us to place the device in and the multiple surgical procedures to change the, uh, the battery afterwards. Uh, with that said, then um, there is an, an, a new innovation, which I'm happy to say it's my innovation. And I'm just going to describe it to you with all of that said. It's kind of a using uh, uh, available technology uh, uh, and to bring the idea or to prove the concept. So using the modified amplexer septal occluder, which comes in a multiple um, device sizes, as you guys can see, so that allows it to be used in multiple uh, uh, age groups, uh, including fetuses. And this is going to be the shell of the pacemaker or the proposed pacemaker device. This uh, uh, using a paper battery, which is a technology that is already present that makes the battery very malleable and bendable, as you can see in this picture. And that can be created and mounted inside the, a shape similar to the amplexer cephal occluder uh, device. Uh, so the idea of this is to, to, to make, to use the ASD, uh, the modified uh, atrial septal occluder device as the shell of, uh, of the device, of the pacemaker device that is proposed. It's leadless, it has variable um, uh, sizes, so it can uh, overcome the limitation of the small marketing uh, group of patients. And the other important idea is it's going to have a rechargeable battery. And the source of power is going to be extremely unique as it is going to be self-charging battery from the motion of the heartbeat itself. Um, so this was actually the actual pacemaker that we usually know. These are some of the, my hand drawings that I use to, uh, to prove the concept of my idea. The proposed uh, ways of deployment of uh, this device would be uh, perventricular in fetal life. It means through the abdomen of the mom to the uterus, uh, to the fetal thorax, and then into the right ventricle. And the other way would be the percutaneous or transvenous in postnatal and older patients. Uh, this is uh, with uh, the cable mounted with the uh, atrocephal occluder device shell without the electronic circuit. Uh, and that was uh, applied to the RV wall of a pig. And you can see here that the delivery cable is inside the right ventricular wall. And in this picture, the internal desk was already deployed. In the second picture here, you can see that the 
uh, cable is still, the device is still connected to the cable. However, the second desk, uh, which is external desk, got deployed as well. And this is the device totally uh, connected to the right ventricle and uh, off the, the delivery cable, disconnected from the delivery cable. Uh, then this is the right ventricle of the pig in uh, open to show the internal desk and the external desk at the same time. And that was done to prove the concept and try to get approval. So this device uh, idea was uh, patent uh, by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And uh, the project plan uh, is summarized into three stages. The first one is the team to become proficient in uh, applying, using the innovative techniques of introducing the device shell into the animal's heart. And the animal proposed was rabbit, uh, New Ze white New Zealand rabbit. And then uh, on, the, on the same time, creation of the electronic portion of the device, including the battery, to mount it into the shell, which is uh, either the ASO shell or other similar uh, device. Uh, and then after we do that, then the last stage would be testing the innovative pacemaker prototype in vivo, uh, including the electronic circuit and the self-charging battery and proof uh, transmission and, and capture, uh, I would say. This device was named the Noctilus pacemaker, and that was named after the, uh, in the 1950s, there was a Noctilus um, submarine that had a very interesting and unique way of uh, uh, charging the battery that allowed this submarine to stay longer underwater compared to other submarines back then, uh, and, and hence the name came out. So the, that was a picture of the submarine that's uh, courtesy of uh, Google. Uh, and uh, uh, that's how the shape uh, looks like. And this is the uh, uh, patent. To conclude my talk is that the fetal pacemaker is closer to reality rather than a dream. Uh, and it should be developed uh, uh, as a uh, a suitable device to fit a wider age range uh, for better marketing of the device. Um, and then the innovation I presented uh, is uh, a work in progress. There is no prototype yet um, and moving forward. And here are my references I used in this talk and I'm ready for any questions. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sousen. And this is really beautiful. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll open the floor for discussion and probably uh, Dr. Silverman will be the first one to ask. Norm, are you there? If he's still, if he's still there. I'm sorry. Yes, I am here. I apologize for just turning off my microphone. Yeah, that's very interesting, Susan, uh, and uh, great work. I hope it, uh, it uh, um, proceeds well. Um, we did one patient with complete heart block, which we tried, uh, unfortunately, to uh, do an open procedure. Uh, we had uh, designed a special pacemaker with only one half a screw and a, a pacemaker that we had sutured into the fetus's abdomen. So it was an open procedure with a thoracotomy, again, placing something in the right, on the right ventricle. But the most important thing is to keep the, um, the wires and the leads in a position where they are, cannot be um, um, affected by fetal movement, et cetera. Uh, anyway, it was worked, the pacemaker worked perfectly for eight hours, but the patient had a cardiomyopathy and succumbed from the cardiomyopathy. So um, I guess um, we just all have these anecdotal experiences and um, it would be great looking at the work from Children's Hospital in Los Angeles with their pacemakers and your work to 
uh, see the progress of this. I, I don't think that there's anything more than um, I can say on this. It's just very interesting, and I hope that it works for a small group of patients in whom it's needed. Uh, I, I also Thank have uh, lots of questions for uh, Dr. Awad. Uh, it's a beautiful idea. So, so what's the difference between your uh, innovation and the Los Angeles group and, and where do they meet and where do they differ? Uh, good question, Rima. Thank you. Uh, I think the idea I have is applicable to a wider age range. So that can make marketing, which means, I guess, basically to uh, make it lucrative for companies to provide uh, more financial support. Uh, because the group in uh, LA, actually, they used, uh, uh, they didn't think of uh, applying that to older uh, ages or postnatal uh, ages. So they used uh, a compassionate um, humanitarian uh, source of fund from the NIH and and they continue to have this kind of idea of just having a fetal uh, pacemaker. Um, and and they keep they keep making it smaller to just fit smaller uh, gestational ages and all that stuff. So this is one. Uh, a uh, big difference uh, we have. The device I have uh, idea is, is going to stay there. You don't need to retrieve uh, or get out. It hopefully will decrease the, the possibilities of pericardial effusion as uh, once you introduce it, uh, the sandwiching property of the device will seal the, the entrance and uh, uh, makes the pericardial effusion less, which seems to be uh, one of the things that led to uh, per significant pericardial effusion otherwise. You mean size-wise, yours is much smaller? Uh, we're talking about fetuses, no? It, about it's variable. Fetuses. It's variable. It's variable size. So you you can... So for fetal you know, life, uh, fetal it, it life, was really, what I'm saying. Fetal it was, life. It was really... again. For fetuses, the size for fetuses, not postnatal, prenatal. It, it is it is available. It, the, the idea is is that if you propose something like that for such a small group of patients, it's it's not uh, worthwhile to 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 spend money. That's from the you know the business point of view. And these are things that I faced earlier in in these uh, in this innovation to convince uh, financial support of my project. Uh, and hence, since the idea was broadened to make it accommodate wider age range, that's why it starts to be more lucrative for uh, uh, for companies to to have financial support. Uh, yes, the size will be suitable for the uh, the fetus at any age because you know that shell has multiple sizes and it's either the shell in particular or a, 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 a different shape but very similar which is really uh, we all know and we can introduce uh, it through a cable as I showed you in the animal model to prove the concept. I think it's beautiful what I understood from your case is that you don't have to recharge the battery the movement of the fetus will recharge the battery is this correct? Uh, the movement, the movement of the heart, so the heart beat. Sorry, oh, the heart, the beating. That oh, the, heart. the device, yeah, the device is sandwiched. It's like the dynamo, you know, when you charge the battery by movement. Uh, okay. You, this is a very basic uh, physics. Uh, so you overcome the battery life so. here. One problem is the battery life, right? Correct. And and if you think about that, for fetuses, it's great. However, for fetuses, we need the pacemaker for a limited period yes. of time until we, we resolve the high drops and or get the baby out of the womb and then do other more conventional treatments. However, if you think about this innovation for postnatal patients who require a pacemaker for a lifetime, then that would be really uh, getting rid of, of all of the multiple surgical interventions that are required every maybe seven to 10 years to change the battery. 
So yeah, uh, just trying to yeah. make it more more lucrative for funding. That's all. Uh, but you also put it, um, I, pardon me if I didn't get it all right, but you, you put the device at the outer row of wall of the, of the right ventricle, piercing the wall of the right ventricle into the inner wall, correct? That's correct. Okay, so postnatally it will stay there and you would you connect it to another one or what will happen? Well, we didn't reach uh, this point yet, so it was just a proof of concept. However, the possibilities are there, whether you need to remove it. I don't think that will be removed. The device will probably endothelialize and just stay in there. Uh, and then either it continues to work, then this is the, feeder, the, the patient pacemaker, or a patient will need a more conventional uh, pacemaker, then it will be applied uh, without touching this one. That's my... Well, what is, what is, Hassan, what is this paper battery? What is it? It's a, it's a form of battery that we all know, but it's coming into a more thinner uh, shape and malleable. So it can be folded without injuring the chemical substances of the battery, which actually creates uh, a more, you know, endless, endless uh, thoughts and and innovative ideas, not only in the pacemaker and a lot of other engineering uh, stuff. Great, thank you so much for uh, really uh, uh, a breakthrough. And uh, I'd like to thank you and all our speakers and our audience. Also to remind our audience is that this uh, series uh, will be uh, on the YouTube probably in one or two hours, this episode today, but the whole series in the YouTube, you can always watch it and um, uh, promote it to your friends. Uh, and uh, we hope to uh, learn together. I'd like to uh, to thank Dr. Suleiman, uh, Sausan, Bree, and Cindy for attending and the Congenital Heart Academy for uh, really hosting such series. Thank you and see you in May, hopefully. Yes, Bye -bye. Okay, thank you, good. thank you. Thank Thanks you very everyone. much. Well done, everybody. Bye. Thank you.